morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this uh, special event uh, today or tonight, uh, whenever it is. And uh, welcome to the online A plus lectures of Pomeranian University in Swupsk. My name is Marek Kukasik, and I'm Vice Rector for Development and Cooperation of uh, the University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, today or tonight again uh, uh, to this event. Um, the event, the A Plus Lectures program, is a special program that is aimed at uh, boosting the international dimension of Pomeranian University in Swupsk. Now, uh, we have had several lectures so far, so this uh, new one today is a really important one because we have a renowned guest with us, Jesper, but I will introduce our guest in a minute. Uh, but before I do that, I will just uh, tell you that the program, the a Lectures program, is realized or is carried out within the framework of our third mission. So the third mission of the university, so reaching out to the society, uh, and uh, this is uh, a well, very important to boost our presence within the society. Now, the lecture will be in English, but uh, later on, uh, you will be able to also access it and see it with, uh, um, with subtitles. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. And I hope you can also do that at some point. Um, so the program itself, uh, as I said, A plus lectures has been going on for some time now. And if you're interested in any of those other lectures, please visit our YouTube channel and you'll find those uh, uh, uploaded and uh, just go to www.apsl.edu.pl website of the university and you will find one of those programs there and uh, that's what you would like uh, that's what i would like you to do if you are willing to uh, watch other um, a plus lectures now it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event with professor jesper yule um and uh, this I, I will not introduce you jesper to a greater detail but i because we have some moderators to do that and i'm so happy that today with jesper we also have Lukas androsiuk of pomeranian university in swupsk and also pavel grabarczyk from it university of copenhagen so welcome hello uh, so Lukas and pavel will moderate this event and i'm so happy to uh, to be able to open this with uh, you guys uh, one thing that uh, I would like to uh, tell you is that you can ask questions through a chat box. Uh, you can see chat box. Usually it's to your right uh, hand corner at the bottom. So you can send your messages and you can start doing it now. I can see now somebody is writing a message. So uh, thank you very much. Right. And uh, also uh, I would like to uh, just um, say that if you're willing to ask any other questions, you can use other channels as well to reach us. Uh, and please do that uh, whenever you like. So Jesper, I guess that if there are other questions after the lecture, I mean, you might be able to answer them at some point. Oh, OK, through, for example, the connection uh, provided by Wukash or Pavo, and that's it. Now, I would like to just add, and that's my last, just, uh, just, just, just last word here. Uh, I would like to emphasize the international dimension of this event. Uh, so we have IT University of Copenhagen. Uh, we have uh, Jesper Yu from, uh, uh, well, are you in Denmark at the moment? Um, yes, it's at the Royal Danish Academy. Yes, so you're there. And uh, I'm currently uh, on a business university business trip to Barcelona, Spain, and you can see it in the background. That's one of the institutes we have very strong ties with. So uh, this, this is what it's all about. So it's all about also boosting the international dimension, as I mentioned in the very first minutes of our meeting today. So well, the only thing what I, which I think I should say is I wish you a very nice uh, lecture. I hope that all of those participants today or tonight will benefit from it greatly. And I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you or meeting you here, Jesper. Feel invited to visit our university at some point. And I will now give the floor to Wukash and Pavel. Uh, and I will just say that I will have to leave 
at some point. I will listen to some of the lecture, but I will have to leave at some point. So please forgive me. I will not be able to uh, well make some final or a closing comments, but it's up to Wukash and Pavel, please. Wukash, Pavel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, again, I would like to thank you, Mr. Wukashi, that uh, there's a main reason that we are here. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I would like to thank you, Jesper, that we meet second time. That will, uh, I will repeat that uh, just a few seconds. And I will just would like to thank you to Pavel, which is very uh, big for me. It's, it's um, you are a very big, great friend, and and I and, and I hope that will be cooperation will be in future. Mm -hmm. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm I'm very pleased that uh, I can help uh, of the students in. Uh, Academy of the students of uh, University Pomerian and uh, but also on other schools and university because this lecture is open. So um, I'm, I'm very happy that this is our second uh, time. The first time was uh, because of conference in, in May, as you remember. Uh, this time we'll be talking about um, a little bit, uh, a little bit, well, about the game, video games, but it would be much more. Uh, much more complicated, I think, so a topic. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's very interesting because uh, it's a connection between digital and analogy era, uh, as I understand. And um, I hope, um, I, I probably I would have so many questions with Pavel and I'm sure that our students also. So um, that's from my side. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I will give you a voice to Pavel. Maybe we'll say something. Yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, let's uh, let's start the talk. I think people are here for that. So let's not talk more about anything else. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Yes, Pierre, this is your time. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to to speak here again. Uh, so let me just share the the correct screen, and then you should be seeing things. Yeah. Please nod if you if you can see the the screen I'm, I'm sharing. Okay, great. All right, so um, so I'll be talking about in a way where I think my, my focus is, is a bit on, on kind of independent games, but I'll also be talking a bit about the the relation between the idea of independent games and the idea of of uh, gamification. Um, so um, the way it comes about in a bit is a bit, a bit is that like my interest as a video game researcher has kind of been in the way video games are meaningful to us as players, right? That um, what happens with kind of popular culture a lot, like when the things like rock music or jazz or cinema or romance novels or video games came around was that people th felt they were basically meaningless, right? But at the same time, it's clear that if you read a romance novel or play a video game, it, it's very clearly very meaningful to you as, as a user, as a player. And so I've been interested in for like a few books now, this question of how video games are meaningful to us. And so in my first book, I talked about how media, games are meaningful in terms of like both the, the stories of fictions and the rule sets. And then I wrote a book about like in the in defense of kind of small games, the kind of games you play on your phone now, how they are meaningful to us. And then I wrote a book about the meaning of, of failing in video games, the one called Art of Failure and about why we play video games, even though they often make us unhappy. And the most recent book, uh, Handmade Pixels, which I'll talk about a bit here, is, is about how like smaller, newer, and more experimental games are often meaningful because they're experiments. Like they, they, they gain often the meaning from being different from what you expect. And sometimes from they sometimes they gain the, gain the meaning from the stories about their production, right? Um, and so, but but why do we actually have uh, something called independent games, or or why do we sometimes feel a need to save games, perhaps by making new games or making experiments? You say one one reason I think is that it feels there's a kind of infinite supply of games that are similar to each other, but just with kind of bigger and bigger budgets. Um, sometimes people criticize Ubisoft, but but certainly. There's something going on on here, right? That that you get kind of games uh, that that feel kind of similar, but just have slightly different skin, and just always like bigger and bigger budgets. Um, at the same time, I think, especially when I started working with video games, 
we often felt that video games had a kind of, might, you might say, an anticipatory potential, right? That video games would set us free in some way, right? That there was something nice about kind of video games or gaming compared to other kinds of activities, right? And then I think the last few years, we've seen lots of situations and things like gamification where people try to use the idea of video games or the structure of games actually to control people instead, right? So the gamification argument is very simple, right? That because games are popular and because, you, because we solve problems when we play games, why shouldn't we just structure the rest of the world like a video game, right? Or as a game. And here's a number of books about that subject. Uh, but you'd say the problem, the basic problem is, is the problem of the of the of measurement in, in a way. So there's a famous anecdote from 1965 that during Khrushchev, uh, supposedly uh, Soviet Union uh, workers were were being paid by by the weight of the total output of a, a certain kind of chandelier factories, certainly, right? And that the chandeliers were then made more and more heavy because that was what the workers were getting a bonus for until they couldn't actually stay in the ceiling, right? And you can say, well, what's going on here? The problem in a way is that if you structure things like games uh, work, you, you risk that people actually try to optimize the way they would optimize a game. And if you set up a bad kind of measurement, such as like passing the ma maximum amount of students or publishing as many papers as possible or making as heavy furniture as possible, that doesn't necessarily lead to quality. So you can see this is, I think, the way that what we thought of as being kind of great and kind of liberatory or anticipatory about games can also be used in kind of very bad ways. So what can we do about that? What I then became interested in was that how especially during the last 10, 15 years, you've seen a number of games which are very different, right? So I will give you a few examples. So here's uh, The Graveyard by Tale of Tales. Here you are an elderly woman, and basically you just walk down a graveyard and then you think about your life. And that's all you do in this game. And that's of course very different from what you expect video games to do. Uh, there's another one here by, by, by Pippin Ba about waiting for hours in real time at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, at the same time as the game looks like a like old Shira adventure game. There's a recent game about being a, a, a goose that's kind of being evil or nasty to, to humans. Uh, there's a, and so a game like this is interesting, right? It's kind of has an, a kind of subdued kind of palette or and it's also interesting because you're not playing a human. It's also interesting because you're not actually being a hero the way you typically expect in video games. You also have kind of interesting experiments like say Blind Drive, which is actually a, an audio only game. So I think what we see is like lots and lots of kind of very interesting kind of argue, uh, experiments in video games. And I'll talk a bit through why I think some of these are really important and how they matter. So the way I went about looking at kind of independent games was that um, I interviewed a lot of festival organizers and game developers. I discussed a lot of games and I did a kind of institutional history of all of the independent game festivals or like the bigger ones and looking at how they kind of selected the idea of independent games over time. Um, and then the idea of the title of the book, Handmade Pixels, is about this point that independent video games, even though they're just collections of bits, are also kind of promoted as handcrafted objects, right? You'd often hear the story of why or how and who made a particular game. So you get a story often, often about these kind of immaterial objects that video games are in the same way you'd get a story about some kind of handcrafted object. So I think independent video games are often promoted as something handcrafted. And that's this, that's the idea of the handmade pixels. And then at the same time, there's this kind of quest or this idea of making like an authentic video game and a video game that's different, say from some of the kind of the Ubisoft games I, I talked about before. Um, but of course you say the problem or the difficult thing is that independent games use the word independent, right? And that's a kind of weird word. So, 
Ah, independent games, independent in the same way that music can be independent or that cinema can in be independent. And so in the book, I talk about how it's clear that when people make independent games and when they use the term, they're very clearly inspired by ideas of independent cinema or say punk music, especially in this idea that you can make something new that rejects say the mainstream or rejects kind of big business. But at the same time, independent games also appeared at a different point in time, right? So uh, then if you look at then the, the theory of say independent cinema, it turns out that people actually really disagree about it. Say Janet Steiger uh, talks about independent cinema as appearing after the breakdown of the studio system in the 1940s. Um, you also have later later movies like some, some of these movies like Jim Jarmusch, which are Kind of black and white or try to have a different tone you might say um, and also say james mcdowell argues that like 1990s and early 2000s uh, independent cinema uh, is kind of quirky uh, and balance kind of irony with kind of sincerity and of course that's when you get, get into that you quickly realize well independent games aren't exactly like independent movies or independent music even if people use the word independent so I think it's worth thinking about like when independent games became a thing, right? Um, so they're quite different from these other things I talked about because they were established really in the mid uh, early 2000s. So I wrote some of this book in my, my local uh, ind independent coffee shop, right? And I asked the owner of the coffee shop if he ever considered adding new locations to his cafe. And his answer was simply, I hate chains, that he hated chain cafes he wanted to have a, like one unique cafe which was his and i think that's pretty telling i think independent games appeared at a time when these ideas of like the local food or, or local culture are really kind of prevalent and really popular right it also means that author, that, that independence isn't just something that's the same across all kinds of media all kinds of cultural form it's a word but then it's like has very specific meaning. And we then talk about what is the meaning here. So uh, one of the things you can see when people talk about independent games is that they consistently talk about authenticity. So Dan Cook says, indie games, that may be a fan of who is cheering on someone authentic and deserving. Edmund McMillan talks about speaking from your heart. Robin Arnott talks about this close relation to the artist. Jonathan Blow talks about like something personal being the opposite of the a kind of glossy commercial product. And Anthropy talks about this idea that you might be able to identify the, an author's style or game developer's style over time. Uh, so that's great. The problem, you might also say what's, what's interesting here isn't, it's just not, it's not just saying that video, independent video games are great. Uh, what they're saying is that independent video games have a certain kind of moral or even political quality to them, right? That there's something better about them. They're not just more fun than other games, but they actually are better in some kind of moral or political sense. Uh, the problem then with talking about kind of authenticity, though, when we say that independent games are authenticity, is that we get to what's called the paradox of authenticity. Uh, this is identified by Julia Straub. It's this idea that whenever somebody tries to tell you, like, this is authentic, that actually becomes inauthentic, right? So uh, this is from, from I gave an earlier version of this talk in Finland, and I noticed that there were these signs for the authentic Finnish sauna experience. And then you can see that, well, it's clearly that a sauna that has this sticker about the sauna being authentic, that sauna seems less authentic than other saunas, right? So the more you try to say that you are authentic, the less authentic you often seem. All right, so that's a preamble. The first question then when I started looking at, at independent games was that whether independent video games were really new, right? Like wasn't there like a lot of home computer games in the 1980s and early 90s where uh, which I know also happened in Poland, right? Uh, where developers would create like really original games and distribute them on, on kind of floppy disks for say their like their Commodore 64 or their Atari 8-bit computers, right? Wasn't this kind of independent games? Um, so we can consider a game like Deus Ex Magna from 1984, 
uh, which is super experimental, right? So it's based on Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man. And so here we we are, I guess, DNA, we be, be being born, we are adult, and we are kind of an old, old person. And at the same time, the game had a soundtrack on the other side of the tape it was distributed on. Um, so was this an independent game? Well, the interesting thing is that at the time, it wasn't being seen or promoted as different from the mainstream, right? The developer Bill Croucher says that he just assumed that like very soon all video games would be like interactive movies. So he wasn't just, he wasn't trying to be different from the mainstream. He was just trying to be mainstream, right? Uh, so you can think of a game like Deus Ex as a, an independent game. Well, it's clear it's kind of experimental. It's made by a small team on a small budget, at least seen from today but it wasn't really promoted as an alternative to the mainstream. I also talked to designer Noah Felstein, who made some of the early Indiana Jones games. And he talked about like when he were doing video games in the 1980s, there was no sense of being independent. Like he, if he was making a video game on a small budget, it was just that that was the budget he had. There was no idea of the statement of making video games in a different way. So I think this can be, seem confusing, but we can distinguish between three kinds of independence, really. And I took this from, from G.F. King, his work on American independent cinema. So the first kind of independence is a game, let's say, independent in terms of its industrial location, meaning like who paid for it, like who owns it, is it being controlled by a large corporation, for example. And that's often what we mean when we say independent. Something can also be independent in its formal or aesthetic strategies. Like, is it different from other games? Does it try to do something different than other games or games with a bigger budget or, or something like this, right? Or finally, cultural independence. So does, is this a game that's trying to make a statement? Does it say something about culture? Is it making a kind of political uh, statement? Or is it trying to make a difference in the world? And I'll, I'll give you some examples and how, how this played out. But I think these, it's very clear when you look at a lot of specific games, these are the kind of notions that actually played out over time. Um, so, but if one thing about it as a history, it kind of starts around 1998, where the game developer magazine, on the other hand, on one hand was in a situation where the video game industry, which was reaching new financial peaks, but also a lot of people were feeling very dissatisfied with the industry and felt it was making kind of too similar, too uninteresting games. And so here in the Game Developer Magazine, the editor Alex Dunn calls for a Sundance Festival for games, like a festival for games in the way like the Sundance, Fe Sundance Festival selects experimental movies. You'd have a, a game festival that would select experimental or at least kind of independent games. If you then look at, say, like the very first Independent Games Festival in, um, in co-located with the Game Developers Conference, you can see that the games that were kind of being selected here were really games that were made in the hope of becoming like real games published on discs, right? So the winner here, Fire and Darkness, was a real-time strategy game in 3D. It was never actually released, but in an interview, with the with the developers, let's talk about this idea that hopefully this will lead to them being picked up by a major publisher. So going to the festival was just a stepping stone for becoming a regular game. Uh, and then we can see this actually if we look at like the, the winners of the independent game festival the first few years, that like almost all of the winners are basically kind of pretty normal uh, 3D or at least isometric games which way it's not super obvious today, from today's vantage point, what would make them independent, right? They just look like regular games. The only standout is, is Bad Milk, but we can discuss that. And then about 2005, I think there's a switch to, so that was the financial independence, like the first step, right? Around 2005, we see a switch to what I call, what we call aesthetic independence, right? So people started making, say like the, the 2D side-scrolling game, the hand-drawn game in a game like Crayon Physics, uh, kind of this kind of weird uh, ahistorical 3D like in Minecraft or, or kind of weird pixelated games like in Fez, right? So suddenly you start having this idea that, that you can make an independent game that is different from other games. So 
the the way people discuss this here was typically it was it's made by like one or two people who were really driven by their passion right and often these games were going back to like 1980s video games um, and I think often to the games of the childhood of, of the developers too, right? And so then one thing I think was interesting when you look at this here is that you can ask, but do, do, do any of these games, like the games here, have, have, have anything kind of really in common, right? And then you can say, well, they do actually have this, this in common, not that they have one visual style, but that they have a particular kind of visual style, right? You use your modern computer or phone for that matter now, to emulate, say, an old computer in, in the case of VVV, VVV, or to emulate like tone paper in and yet it moves, or to emulate kind of crayon drawings in, in crayon physics, right? So we can see that there's something I call the independent style, which is that you use your modern computer, you do it to make a representation of another kind of representation, right? Your modern computer makes a representation of painting or of an old computer or something like this. And typically, uh, you emulate something that's kind of low tech and cheap, not always, but usually, right? And I think this signals that this game was was kind of more immediate and more kind of honest than big budget titles. Or saying that in another way that it was on purpose that you made a game on a small budget, right? Uh, it's also a way to say that you're not trying to compete with kind of big budget uh, 3D titles. You're doing something deliberately different. And so I think that's that's the role that something like this visual style plays. Uh, you can also think about it a bit how this 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 kind of focus on the the personal creation or on small productions or on the handcrafted actually connects to other things, right? So of course it connects to idea of a kind of local food production or do it yourself or maker spaces or things like this or this idea that you need to know where the chicken you eat was raised. You want to hear a story of where the, where the food comes from. And you can see this is actually very similar to the arts and crafts movement of, of the, like the 19th century, which was also a reaction against machine production or mass production. And this idea that you could go back in time, say to medieval architecture and think about the way that was produced and then create something new, a, a kind of better world out of that. Uh, you can look at it actually very concretely here in, in this house called Red House by William Morris and Philip Webb uh, that they designed. So this is for us uh, elements from medieval Gothic architecture, especially like the prominent chimneys and the steep roofs. As so why did they do that? Well, they did, actually did believe that in medieval times, buildings were uh, products were, were done in a better way than today. So they borrowed a style to say that they preferred in a way that the kind of earlier medieval time and the way the world was structured. This is also the way you can say that, that there's a kind of anti-modernism in, in independent video games that they often kind of react against the kind of mainstream in, in kind of interesting ways, right? Um, I think also, it's all, you also get it a lot, I think when people talk, especially about say, um, kind of free to play games or micro games based on micro transactions today that, a lot of people feel that there's something kind of wrong with that and they want to go back to earlier models, say like the game where you pay like one pri a fixed price up front, for example. So I think we see this a lot in, in independent games, a kind of rejection of what's kind of mainstream and what's kind of modern in games. And there's this, this desire to go back in time and borrow kind of earlier elements. Um, so, so I think you can think of it a bit as this kind of strategy from a, from a designer's point of view. So, so if you wanna, you're making an independent game the, and you can kind of promote it as a, per, and you wanna emphasize the personal, the financial independence of the game, you, you might promote it as personal. You wanna explain how it's kind of made out of passion and you wanna tell about how the, there's a kind of certain story to the creation that's kind of meaningful, meaningful to players. This was the example of Cuphead, which obviously has this kind of story about how they really wanted to make the project and how they lent a lot of money to do it and so on and how they worked really hard. So that's really common to get this kind of story, right? Um, aesthetic independence, independence again, often is tied to kind of new kind of themes, new kind of new kind of themes and new stories and new visual styles and often kind of new ways of playing. Uh, so, so here's come some kind of extreme examples. On one end is, is uh, Dear Esther, uh, which is a game 
often called a, called like, like a walking simulator, which kind of borrows the technology of first person shooters, but just removes all the violence and the challenge in order to tell a story instead, right? And here's Starseed Pilgrim, uh, which is a game that kind of does basically the opposite. Uh, this is a game that's in a way which rejects how modern video games are often very focused on helping the player. So Starseed Pilgrim is the opposite. It's like very opaque. It doesn't tell you anything. So it's all about forcing you to discover things for, for yourself, right? And um, so I talked about how independent games are a reaction against something like a mainstream, but what is that actually? So here's a 2001 article from Bruce Shelley, a guideline for guidelines for developing successful games. And he has these kind of pieces of advice. So you should reach for a broad audience, that's the left column. But then you can see it's very clear that a lot of independent games actually try to reach a niche or a small audience, right? Uh, you should uh, differentiate and innovate. But then, OK, this is clearly borrowed. Uh, the, program, the player should have the fun, not the design and a program or a computer. But I think often you, you in the independent games, you have games that aren't really meant to be fun, which actually are about the developers, developers say personal experience. It's not about fun necessarily, right? Uh, we can go through each of these and say that, well, these kind of guidelines that he made, which seems perfectly reasonable, are guidelines that in some way have been violated or broken by specific independent games, right? So we can see, what we can see is here that there are, are a set of conventions for how to do a, a commercially successful game. And then every one of these conventions have been kind of broken in some way by an independent game. Um, and so you can see that also it helps us think a bit about how well this works when we get to the kind of third level of cultural independence. So right, this is here we often get this idea that, that there should be new creators, uh, people who didn't we didn't think were making video games. There should be kind of political themes. Uh, there should be a, say like a game about kind of gender identity like dysphoria or a game about kind of suffering from depression the game like still stand and also often we get this kind of argument about better ways of working so for example the the copenhagen based game developer uh, triple topping they actually tell you on their website how much how much money everybody makes so everybody may ha makes the same amount of money for example so it's an attempt at making a more kind of democratic or kind of better way of working and so you can see these steps, right? Either focusing just on the financial aspects of a game, focusing on how the game is different from other games, and then finally focusing on this idea of, of making a game that either says something by itself or is produced under different or better circumstances than, than other games. And so, so you could think of this as, a, say, if you are an, were or are an independent game developer, you can think of these as kind of different strategies, like. If you're financially independent, you promote a game as personal and made from passion. Aesthetically independent is often new themes and new visual styles. Culture dependent is often about kind of new creators or new players or political themes or better ways of working. So, so I finished this book in, in 2019 and I, I was wondering like what, I think about a bit of what, what has happened since. And I'll give you a few examples of what I think has been happening the last few years. So, so here's a game called called Tux and Fanny. Um, so this is a part of what you might call a, a kind of cha chaotic and somewhat kind of often kind of glitchy kind of game. So we have these two characters going around the wor world and has this, lots of these kind of very strange kind of kind of mini games. So in a way, there's something kind of kind of playful, but also something kind of existential at the same time as it's using these kind of glitchy, kind of old school uh, visuals. Um, you can also take a game on a Polish game like, like kind of make Pixel, which I think is kind of interesting in the way it kind of uh, kind of swishes a lot of video game and story conventions uh, together in a kind of very small and, and tight tight space. Um, I don't know how you read it. I don't think uh, make Pixel is culturally. I think it's aesthetically independent. It's certainly trying to do something different, but I'm not I'm not reading it as making a political or cultural statement. I could be wrong, right? Uh, you also have games like in Inscription, I think, which is part of a, a certain tradition or a certain trend of kind of making analog games in digital form. 
So this this kind of borrows from the kind of card game, but it's a little kind of surreal, uh, the battle card game or the battle deck. Uh, another game of this style would be Dicey Dungeons, which also kind of makes a video game about something analog, like kind of dice rolling. You also have the whole tradition or the whole tradition now of, of the documentary game. So so um, this is about like World War II, right? Um, there's also like a Norwegian game about Leben, Lebensborn and a more recent Danish game called called Gerda. So this idea that you can can use video games to discuss uh, traumatic events in, in new ways and also kind of often sometimes combine the very documentary with the bit more kind of freeform play. And I think that's a kind of super new, uh, kind of interesting uh, trend. Um, then there's the kind of the, the therapeutic trend. So I just mentioned this game before, uh, Still Stand which is a Danish game. It's about being in your 20s and having an existential crisis in, in Copenhagen during a, a heat wave, basically. And it's not that you don't do a whole lot in this game. You just mostly click, but then can you, you can, that kind of takes you through the kind of story of the game. Uh, you also see a game like like a recent game, like, like a short hike, which um, I would read as a game in a way about finding joy in life to some extent, right? So it is to some extent about just doing something kind of relaxing in game form, right? And so I think that's, to me, that's kind of the kind of interesting, what I'll end with, which I think is are the kind of current trends in independent games. Uh, one of this, the kind of glitchy collage, uh, the analog games in digital form, the documentary, the personal, and the kind of therapeutic, the discussion of kind of emotional vulnerability and, and, and things like that. And so, so that's to me, and I mean, to me, I think, do, I do think like independent games are kind of gift that keeps on giving to some extent, right? That, that we've talked about independent games for, for, for 20 years. And I think they've probably been kind of understood by a broad public during the, for the last kind of 10 years, but it's also kind of interesting to see how independent games both are its own thing compared to say independent cinema in that independent games are very much based and this idea of the, the kind of the handcrafted and and the sometimes the glitchy, sometimes the analog, sometimes the kind of very simple. It's often based on signaling uh, a kind of low budget, like on purpose, right? But I also think that it's something that kind of continues. I think for me to make kind of video games interesting, right? That independent games to me are really also a lot about just taking whatever we think is a good video game, like in Bruce Shelley's list and then trying to do the opposite. And so in, to me, then that's, I think what the role independent games play is just like continue, to continue to surprise us with new things that we hadn't seen before. And then whenever we think we figured out what video games are, there will be an independent games that, that shows us that we didn't know. And I think that's, that's a good thing. And I think that I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you very much, Jesper. Um, I, I am sure there's a, a, a couple of questions. Um, Pavel, maybe you will, would like to start. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to, to kickstart it. Uh, thanks, uh, Jesper, for a very interesting lecture. I was um, especially, I'm especially happy that you left us with some of ideas of how, where new independent games are moving towards, what are, what are the trends and so on. I'm curious about one trend that hits me very strongly when I look at the, the new independent games that you did not mention. Maybe you just think it is actually an odd, odd thing. Uh, and that is reviving genres. I think that this is a very, like a very strong uh, strain in indie games. And what is interesting is that the new, the indie developers do find genres that lie dormant and then try to revive them. And I think what changes a lot is that the technological possibilities that, that people have, uh, the tools and, and the better processing powers of machines, let people revive genres we, we didn't think of. Like the starting point would be platformers, right? Platformers, Metroidvanias, roguelites. This, this was the starting wave. But now we're starting to see, for example, a, a, a very prominent strain of indie games that try to replicate the experience of FPS games, like single player FPS games, which took me by surprise because I didn't think that independent games will be moving into this direction, right? It's a genre that 
not long ago was like the staple of AAA. And then all of a sudden, it is a new indie darling, so to speak. I'm curious what you think about this trend. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that, yeah, but it's, it's a good point, right? And I think you could say that, that yeah, it, it's only a question of economics, right? That that, that, that things that, that in a way, that, especially when you get, when you have like what, might, what we call triple A, right? That, that has a certain, a certain kind of economic pressures on that distribution channel, which just means that, that they, they will only make games if they're ac absolutely sure there's like a giant audience, right? And so it just yeah. means that there are just certain things that can't get made in in that in that kind of distribution channel with that business model just for for, for economic reasons yeah no, but, it, but it's interesting and i think perhaps what that also shows like your example is that like how, how much often this is driven by by very kind of personal nostalgia right that 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 is often driven about someone who played a game as a kid like very literally and then now they played a game when they were 10 and now they're 30 and they 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 got they kind of they 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 graduated and and they they have some connections and they tried to do something and now they're actually making a, a kind of com somewhat commercial game in in independent game channels. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you said that that I think that it perhaps it also illustrates a bit of a tension I think within independent games right between independent games as as a kind of personal expression uh, and independent games as something which is a bit more about kind of a kind of a service in a sense or scratching an itch right that 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 the kind of scratching an itch kind of angle is typically not the one that wins awards in in festivals so it also often has to be kind of a bit more uh, something a bit more experimental and and typically i think typically if people shy a bit away from violence in, in the festivals that's kind of considered kind of too mainstream and, and kind of triple a Right, so I think it just highlights some tensions, but it's it's kind of kind of great point, right? So I think, but I think you know that the, yeah, I'm, I'm teaching at a design school, right? And, and and the fashion designers always talk about the twenty year rule. Yeah. That, I've that, heard of the thirty years rule. That's interesting. Yeah, I think the, the, the fashion designers say say twenty. I, I agree that yeah. it might be a little more closer to. No, it depends a little, right? Twenty thirty years, right? Depends, right? Yeah, I mean, but it depends, like, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, Close like, that it's like 10 to 15 years old is completely looks horrible and by the way it's 20 years old it, it, it looks it looks great again i should actually show i have this slide i'm just showing this one of the slides that i didn't actually show and um, so um um so let me just let me just show you something right so that that was one thing that happened when i was doing the when i was doing the book was that like when i was when i was when in the in the beginning i was showing people uh, this game uh let me show it here again uh, this game called fire and dark the fire and darkness game here and everybody like agreed that it looked it looked horrible like who would play this like blocky 3d and then while i was finishing the book people just suddenly started to say it looked great and like, that literally happened like during the, the course of like two That's years right? like just like very very concretely and that was just this kind of that was just this kind of 20 year kind of window where suddenly kind of blocky 3d started started looking good again yeah I mean, I think that the years, the rule of the number of years that is used in the rule depends. And I guess it's all about who has the buying power at the given moment. So so basically the generation that up to a given point did not have their own money. Now, all of a sudden they start to earn, they have disposable income and they start to chase some of the things from their childhood. That, that's the way I understood it, the mechanism always. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, if, if I may add one more, because like uh, that, that is also is very interesting to me. I the other thing that I observe when it comes to independent games right now, and and it's fascinating for me. I've uh, yesterday I think I saw. Uh, I mean, it's the end of the year. People are making lists of best games. I've seen a, a list of thirty best games by Paste Magazine, and I would uh, like roughly say that eighty percent of them are indie games. I looked at this list and then what really surprised me is when I realized that like, again, 90% of these indie games are on Game Pass. And, and, and that is actually very interesting to me because all of a sudden indie games started to be using as a, as a huge asset by a company. So mm -hmm. uh, this is, for me at least, this is what, what really changed that all of a sudden these games that Absolutely, they are made out of passion, but now we have this very strong channel of, of a corporate marketing that uses 
and uh, Nintendo is doing the same way with uh, the yeah. same thing with you know the Nindies uh, uh, presentations and so on. So I think this is also a huge change. I don't know what, what do you think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, you say also the problem in a way is that AAA games have become so big, but they take like many years to make. And then, then, uh, yeah, then, then I think from yeah, you know this from like the platform holders, they see indie indie games as a quick way to fill yeah. the like the e store, right? So, so, so that's also I think people are also complaining a bit about say Sony that their interest in in indie games kind of goes and comes and goes whether depending on how close it is to platform launch, like when they launch a new platform, they really love independent indie games. And then they kind of forget about it a bit, at least I think between the PS4 and P PS5. Right. True. Yeah, I, I remember this. Um, but thank no, you. No, but actually, so, so um, no, no, keep on. Go, go on. No, I, I would like to say uh, it's it's very interesting uh, topic that you are talking about right now, uh, Pavel. Thank you for this question because it's interesting. I will. Um, I I have some some philosophical questions, and I can I say, and some cultural um, cultural uh, consequence in in this kind of meaning. Um, when I'm talking about uh, independent, there's always a question independent of what? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the question of independent of what? Uh, is it mean that are independent of, um, I don't know, uh, ideology that we are uh, work uh, that we uh, that we are in exist independent of big business or something so, something like this one? But you said the word that I. Um, I, I think it's much more useless in the kind. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's much more. Uh, 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 it's 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 useless because of our uh, definition. So you said about um, independence game, and you said alternative, and it, it's it's. I think alternative. It's it's word that for me it's much more useless. It's like an. in in the show business in the movies and uh, and music. So. And when I talk about alternatives, I am alternative because of uh, and of the main main structure. So alternative for me, it's much more clear. So it's 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 uh, I'm not uh, I'm not to pretend someone to be someone else or or something like this. This is, this is my suggest. The second the second point is that is that we look something very interesting in the independent games right now and the triple A games. So. I um I don't know maybe you agree with me Pavel and Jesper but um th th there is some sometimes the 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 triple game try to be an independent game this is something very interesting when we talk about uh this uh, kind of uh, hellblade uh, games that was uh, ninja theory studios that's, that's the commercial idea of this game was this is a, a independent game but looks like triple a game and so on and so on i don't know how it works is this a business strategy or 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 oh because i'm you you know i'm great i'm i'm not i, I i'm just play independent games but it doesn't mean that uh that uh, they 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 show not so so effective and so on and the third point is i remember the article pavel that's for you when you uh, read about the hardcore and casual games and mm -hmm. you said that it's very hard to define what is uh, hardcore and casual games i think it's similar problem when we talk about uh, triple aaa games and independent games and um, the last thing um at uh, at the beginning i have some suggest some suggest that when we think about uh, uh, independent game we usually see the uh, the main character for example when i talk about uh, immortality that i play it right now i think about sam barlow uh, and i would say that oh that's that's something very interesting but it's not because when i'm thinking about metal gear solid which is triple game and also think about Hideo Kojima. So uh, the, the 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 reason that the independent games are responsible one person, I I um it's not correct, and uh, I don't know how how it works. So so the point is um when when someone asks me uh, what is independent games, I would probably not problem to recognize. But if if someone try to define that, I have so many problems to define what is. This is like the art. Yeah, thank you. That's all. So I think so. In I know so. Pa Pavel also did a different definition of of independent games, and 
than, than mine. But I think you say that the way I went about it, you might say that in a kind of nominal sense. So I was interested in the games that were being promoted as independent or through independent channels. So I'm not so much saying like this is or isn't an independent game, just saying that that you say that there are three different rhetorics, if you will, of, of independence. So so like yeah, we made this on our own budget, like the financial, or like we made a different kind of experience, the aesthetic independence, or we made a game that makes a difference in the world to make a statement, like that's the cultural independence. It's a borrowing for this guy, GF King. And so I think that's that's also why it works. I think I like the way that works across like different domains, if you will. And so so alternative is can, is, is more difficult to use in, in that respect. So, so it does make sense to say alternative financial i guess you could but it's like so i mean but it doesn't really matter so but so the focus was the reason i choose chose the term independence was to look at like in a way like how that worked say in in festivals and as more among developers as as a specific kind of concept right so so um yeah i'm not defining it i think powell has a stronger definition than mine i think i mean at least a stronger opinion maybe i'm very wrong about my definition but so but my answer to you, Lucas, would be that if you want to, in my paper, I, I suggested to use two words, independent and indie, to refer to different things. So independent, in my opinion, is fairly, at least the definition is doable. You can say that, yes, you are independent financially, you are independent culturally, you are independent uh, from the mainstream in terms of ideology, then this is what it means that you are independent, that you are not dependent on an existing structure, whether it's financial or cultural or something else, or at least you think you are not. Now, and in this sense, you are independent. And, game, and then the problem is that from the perspective of a player or a user, all these metrics, all these things that make the game independent are external. To know if a game is truly independent in this sense, the user would have to use uh, look into the production uh, uh, of the game, would have to uh, read the interviews of the creators and believe that the intentions that are presented in these interviews are true. So all these things are very hard to, to, to get to. So typically users, when they look at a game, they start to just associate the term indie, in this case, with what the game looks like, not how it was produced, not what... Uh, what they don't look into you know the the bookkeeping mm -hmm. of, of the creators they just look at a game and then they create some kind of an internal definition based on the looks of the game so because all of the games that they encountered up to some point were either pixel graphics or pol or simple polygons they start to think oh being a pixel graphics game is an is an independent game it means yeah. it's an independent game or if if a game makes a strong political statement consciously not unconsciously like i don't know call of duty but very consciously makes it political statement they associate it with being an indie game but then they may learn oh shit this game was actually made using public funds is it then independent that's the, that's the problem uh, and games such as um, uh, 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 i forgot the name of the game you mentioned in immortality no no i was thinking about these bigger iii games okay i'll give you another Hellblade. Example. Hellblade. Hellblade. Games such as Hellblade, or a good example of a recent game would be Stray. These are games that if you look at the production aspect, and if you look at this uh, ideology aspect, they are purely indie games because they are made by small teams with their, their own money. Uh, in the case of Stray, people who went stopped working at Ubisoft and they really wanted to make a personal game. So from this point of view, they are 100% indie games. Problem is that they don't look as in the games. So then mm -hmm. you have this is where the tension comes from. Yes, uh, the external things and the internal things of the game. But, uh, but yeah, thank you. To, to follow up on that, so so I think you say going back to the Hideo Kojima question, I think you say that that it's rare, it's relatively few big budget AAA games where people know the creator. So Kojima is one of the exceptions, right? And I think it's much more common. For, for independent games, for people to know who the creator is. So it's not like a hard and fast thing, but it's like, I think it characterizes AAA that people don't know, know, know who made them, I'd say basically. But 
But I think that was what you were saying with like India as a style. I think this is also something people discuss in cinema and music as well. Like the, well, we start having independent labels, and then suddenly after a while, it becomes a style rather than <laughs> than than something kind of true or, or heartfelt, right? And you say that in music, music especially, that this was always the worry that that the the, the big there would be this authentic punk or hip hop, and then that there would yeah. be this kind of big evil kind of publishers kind of kind of making fake punk or fake hip hop. And how could you, because they were just emulating the style that was originally really heartfelt and so on. Um, so so first of all, it's that's always kind of weird, right? Because then you get into this like long fights, fist fights about who's like the authentic punk band. And also both punk and hip hop start out as really artificial genres, right? They have with Malcolm McLaren and things like this. So it's actually really, the starts of, of these genres are, are kind of really, really sketchy in a sense, right? Um, so um, also going for, yeah. But then I think also, it, I think it works slightly different in video games because it's just a different time, right? Now we're in this kind of platform time, right? So there's no need for Microsoft to manufacture a, a kind of fake indie game by copying the style, right? They, because the, the, there's a thousand small game developers who throw themselves at Microsoft's feet and offering Microsoft the games so Microsoft can get at least 30%, right? And so that's the same with the like Steam and the App Store and everything. So, so today they, they, they make they make lots of money on, on indie developers and they don't have the, the, this idea like they why would they try to manufacture fake indie? Why why what that what does that even mean? Is there's really no need? They get a thirty percent cut no matter what they do. I I, I remind my um, even in your book, uh, Jesper, um, I'm talking about. Uh, the, the book uh, called The Pain uh, in Video Games, you mentioned Noel Carroll. And um, uh, I remember his great book, The Philosophy of Mass Art. There was some great suggestion between what is the, um, what is the connection between popular art, mass art, and independent art. And this is maybe the interesting key uh, in this discussion is that it's possibly, there is, a, there is a big possibility that someday the um, alternative or independent or indie games will be much more popular than some mass art uh, 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 movies, games, and so on and so on. So if you know what I mean, the Carol said that um, it, it, it's uh, for let's for, let's let's uh, uh, I, I forget this name, but we have we know we know so many examples uh, movies games uh, and and mu music that uh, they are so popular for example i don't know Aphex twin it's, it's it was many years ago it was independent alternative music but right now it's on the mass culture very popular so do you think this this um, there is some some possibility that in a few few next years some independent games will be much more popular than some mass art mass popular games well, I mean, there've been incredibly popular independent games. Um, let's see. I'm, I was trying to think about. Yeah, I guess even something like getting over it with Bennett Foddy. I mean, that has a certain kind of mass recognition, at least kind of in meme culture. But also older games like, yeah, say like, yeah, Braid and and Super Meat Boy were obviously kind of super popular. And then if you think we think a bit about outside this particular box. Um, no, so something like say like games we'd call like a hyper casual like uh, all of these like like fall down or collect something these these kind of mobile games they they're not they don't they're not trying to they're not making any kind of aesthetic or cultural argument i think but but certainly they're made by pretty small teams a lot of the time and can be actually weirdly experimental and and i think some of those are are kind of played by more people than than say call of duty certainly but but they're not like they don't read as indie the way we talked about, and they're, they're not necessarily so so aesthetically interesting. I mean, I might only add that I mean this question seems to be surprising in a world in which Minecraft is the best-selling game. <laughs> yeah, it is yeah. an independent game. Of course, now it's bought by Microsoft, but it's yeah, 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 and you're right. That's that, that's the best example. Yep. Uh, so. so I, I mean, and also you have to remember that i mean being successful is always relative to how much you had to spend on it and how many people worked on it so i would argue that people who created a game such as valheim a year ago which was a huge success and still is 
are preferably much better off when it comes to how much they earned individually than people than a bigger group that made a sl uh, slightly successful AAA game because there yeah, were yeah, yeah. hundred people <laughs> that you have to divide. So, so guys, can we can we agree that the border between in some case the border between uh, AAA games and indie games are very thin? Can we agree with that or? I wouldn't say it's a border and it's not even a sliding scale. So so it's a bit more that, that things can be presented as indie or triple A in, in different ways, right? So so I wouldn't I wouldn't even say that that it, yeah. So so I think it's a little more fluid than that, right? And then you can read things in different ways and something like yeah. So mine Minecraft is obviously the good example, which kind of clearly starts out as something we we perceive as indie. And now it's it's owned by Microsoft, and then it just it has a slightly different it has a completely different feel. And then if you're if you're if you're a kid, you might might meet meet kind of educational material based on on Minecraft and, and things like that. So then it has a, it has a completely different role than what it had had initially. Even though to some extent it's the same game in its kind of concrete material sense. And okay, thank you. So and this difference is. Uh, on purpose blurred by companies often. So you have to, uh, an example that comes to mind is, um, now the name escaped me, uh, a Sony exclusive Returnal. Uh, Returnal. This, this would be a good example. This is a game that probably wouldn't be called an AAA game in a, in a in different year. But since Sony needed something for ps5 and a ps5 exclusive it was promoted as an aai game even though it was made by a venerable but still very small finnish team that no that that uh, i would call them in a, in this sense i would call their production style more similar to independent production style than than any AAA. but sony needed its big hits that was supposed to be promoted as an aai game so all of a sudden it sold like that yeah so no matter, I, I think this is a conclusion maybe, um, no matter how we call it in the independent or alternative games, we need independent games uh, because of reason that, uh, that Jesper sell it, because of experimental and uh, because of uh, uh, because of all this new mechanics, all this, uh, this ex 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 expression and so on. So I think it's a, it's a very important part of a games industry. But, but actually, what one footnote to that is also that that is also very different in in different countries and, and territories, mm -hmm. right? So, and I mean, I mean, Poland Poland has like a, has some has some big game companies now, right? But it, in companies that in, in countries that don't have that, right? I, I talked to some people from Brazil a few years back, where it was just more like, I mean, you didn't have the other thing, right? So you only had had small small budget productions, right? And so so independent just meant in a way. Being being making games any way any way you could and and actually being in a situation where, where there wasn't any kind of major infrastructure or capital available right but then if you are in a place where there is where there are big kind of triple A companies then then independent can be can can feel something different it, then it has that kind of alternative quality that it doesn't necessarily have if you're in a territory without a big game industry. Very good point. And let's not remind about the difference that I, I personally still struggle with, the difference between indie games or independent games and uh, Daojin games in Japan. Yes. Like, should, like This shows that there can be something kind of similar, but because of the uh, culture difference, the difference in culture, it feels completely different. That it's yeah, and I think yeah, in Japan, they're also unsure whether, whether it's the same thing or not, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's no, super interesting. Yeah, but it, but it also but it's a bit like this thing like if you buy if you get um there's something handcrafted right that you can you can go both you'd both be in a in a in a in a rich country full of mass production and get something handcrafted or you can be in a poor country and get something handcrafted and it might actually mean very different things true in those two situations right well, uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will just say that we are also on YouTube and I'm sure that in the near future there will be some comments uh, about this topic. Um, I would like to I would like to thank you again, Jesper. Uh, Thanks, and I, 
I would like to Pavel. Thank you also. Thanks, so I would like to all my students and um, attendants that are on YouTube. Uh, if there is something, what can I do for you, Jesper, on Pavel? So this is right time. Maybe you have some wishes or no? No, not really. No. no, no, no. No. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and that's all for today. Um, um, maybe some, some clear conclusion. Um, independent games are uh, in the in, in very important part of, of uh, culture, not just a game business. And, and this word independent uh, are very important. And um, I, I, there is so many inspiration and I probably I will read more um, this this topic. So <clears throat> thank you again, and that's all thank for you. today. Thank you. Bye-bye. It was a great discussion. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot.